everybody, this is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and I hope you all have a happy new year. Uh, 2022 looks like it's going to be a interesting year for the hobby, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So, back in November, I picked up a really interesting card that I've been looking for for a long time, and actually I've never seen in person. And um, as you know, that sometimes when you see a card in person and get to hold it in your hand, it's a very different experience uh, than when you see it online. And that was definitely the case for me. Um, in, in any event, this happens to be an 1887 uh, Allen & Ginter American Editors uh, card of Charles Taylor. And I'm sorry that it's not focusing very well. Uh, let me see if I can... There you go, that's better. All right, and so let me show you the back of this card too, because it's really kind of neat. Um, sorry guys, I'm still getting used to this. All right, there you go. And, and again, they did a really good job on this set. Um, and so as you can see, uh, it says first series. And there's actually, there's 50 pictures of American editors. And, and these guys were really rock stars of their time. Uh, everybody knew who they were. Um, and so, uh, Jefferson Burdick uh, issued a prefix for this set called N1, and there's a similar set of American Editors, which is a, a larger format series called N35, and the majority of collectors and researchers uh, and dealers will say that the set was issued in 1887, though I, I've heard... Um, that it was issued in 1888, and then uh, some some people say uh, the larger series was issued in 1889. Um, and, and the thing is, uh, unlike baseball or any kind of sport, uh, issue, issuing a correct date for a non-sports set is not easy. Um, because usually they'll go by um, when a player was on that particular team and then match everything else. So that's it's somewhat similar to this set as well. But um, it, it, like I say, um, it's not always correct. So I'm actually thinking that it's more along the lines of 1887 uh, and no, no further than 1889 because in 1890, uh, the American Tobacco Company was formed, uh, and Allen and Ginter was actually the last um, company to come on board in 18, I think, uh, January of 1890. Anyway, um, the set has a lot of like really interesting uh, journalists and editors in it. Uh, one of them being uh, Joseph R. Hawley. So Hawley was a Governor of Connecticut, and he was also the um, he was also a, sen a, a senator and a Civil War general. Um, he does have those three cards that I know of, and the biggest one being the uh, 1888 presidential possibility set from uh, Duke Son and Company, uh, and it happens to be one of my favorite sets uh, during the 19th century. Uh, this one's not too far behind. So, um, you also find James B. McCullough, and uh, I, I believe that he was the first uh, journalist to actually sit down and interview people for his articles, um, something that I don't think has was done prior to the Civil War, but he, uh, he interviewed uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, um, and then you have <laughs> Joseph Pulitzer. And um, Pulitzer was is probably the biggest name in this uh, in this set. Uh, obviously, you have the Pulitzer Prize, and, and that comes from uh, Columbia University uh, after his death in uh, 1911. And so, uh, Pulitzer actually was indicted in 1909 um, for libeling uh, President Teddy Roosevelt and J.P. Morgan. Um, in, in a, uh, a, a scam, which didn't occur. Uh, but that that suit was dropped. It didn't go anywhere. Um, however, uh, in 1916, uh, Pulitzer's 
a New York world. Um, they they uh, were sued by a Gimbel's department store, which let's see if I have a card. So this is real quickly. This is uh, from the 1916 M101 set, and again, it's not really focusing very well. Um, anyway, so this is uh, this is Bill Doak. Uh, it's, it's not a nice kind of nice card. Uh, I, I do enjoy uh, this set very much. Anyway, so that set and actually that suit was uh, carried forward and um, Gimbel has won a million dollar civil suit uh, against the New York world. And I think it was later overturned, I think in 1921. Uh, um, and and the uh, editor of the magazine, or the newspaper, did spend some time in jail as well uh, for it. Um, so getting back to the American Editors series, um, the the funny thing about uh, Taylor here is that he had four, actually, I'm sorry, he had five kids, and four of them ended up uh, working for the Globe. Um, one of them in particular is of great interest to me because um, I am from Boston, and I do follow the Red Sox, uh, especially their history. And so uh, John I. Taylor ended up purchasing the Red Sox from uh, Henry Kalia um, of the uh, American League. He's actually founder of the American League, one of them. They had five founders of the American League, and he was one of them. Uh, he was a very big name back then. Uh, and he went on to uh, purchase the, Ameri uh, the American Cleveland Naps, which, uh, you know, I'm not entirely certain if he actually did purchase the team. Um, he did purchase the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, I believe of the American Association, a minor league club, uh, later on. But uh, what was interesting was that uh, Ben Johnson really didn't want... Um, John Fitzgerald, the uh, grandson, the grandfather of JFK, to purchase the Red Sox in 1904, uh, or you know, shortly after the uh, Red Sox won the first World Series. So he gave it to uh, um, John T I Taylor, and he had the team until 1911, and then he became the minority owner until about 1914 or so. The Taylor family actually has a long history with the Boston Globe, although uh, growing up, I, I really didn't read that newspaper. Um, and in fact, this was an eight newspaper town at one point uh, from where I'm in Boston. Um, and growing up, I actually uh, read the newspaper at an early age because I saw my father reading the newspaper and my grandmother as well. And I think I've kind of told you guys that uh, my grandfather was a reporter for the Evening Democrat in uh, Fort Madison, Iowa in the 1930s and uh, before uh, the Navy called upon his services to fight in World War II. Um, and in those days, you didn't need a journalism degree. And I think my grandfather actually uh, went to college on the GI Bill after the war but I don't think he actually ever graduated. In fact, um, some of the journalists that I talked to today, uh, a few from the Boston Globe, have said that, that there's absolutely no need for a journalism degree. Uh, and, and so uh, all you need is a drive uh, and, and a sense of uh, responsibility uh, to report the news accurately and fairly. Um, and so and that kind of gets me to uh, this card right here. So this, as you can see, is a very blurry image of uh, Colonel Cody, and William um, Buffalo Bill Cody. Let's see if I can try to get this better. There we go. All right. So it's actually a very nice card. I just picked that up as well. Um, and the reason why I'm showing it to you uh, in this is because of uh, the movie Hidalgo. So in 2004, Disney issued this movie called Hidalgo based on what they said was a um, 
uh, a, a true uh, based on true events. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it seems like everything that um, Frank T. Hopkins said in his journal, which came out in the 1940s, was not true at all. Um, Hopkins actually was a long distance uh, rider, but uh, he never actually um, traveled to um, uh, was it the Ring of Fire uh, in the Middle East to participate in a, a long distance race. Uh, there is absolutely no evidence that he uh, worked with Buffalo Bill Cody's um, Wild West show at, at all. And that's why I bring that up. Uh, Disney and the director uh, didn't really do a whole lot of uh, background investigation. Although it, the movie is really good and I, I really enjoy it. I, I, I really think that maybe you should watch it if you haven't. Um, but it's a it's another story altogether that has been embellished uh, by either the writer or, um, in this case, by Disney itself. Um, and in back in back of me, uh, I have a whole uh, row of uh, auction catalogs, and. Um, I, I really enjoy kind of flipping through those catalogs, uh, and I have about 30 to 40 years worth back here uh, that I go through. And one of the uh, one of the uh, stories that I I've read throughout a lot of these catalogs is that of the 1934 Gaudi um, Napoleon Lajoie. Now I, I bring that up uh, as a similar. Um, instance with uh, with uh, Hopkins and uh, Buffalo Bill Cody here um, in that usually the greater the story being told um, in these auction catalogs uh, when it comes to the backgrounds of these cards isn't necessarily true. Um, I, I haven't seen any data su to suggest that um, the reason for um, Napoleon Lajoie's um, participation in the 1934 Gaudi set. Now, we do know certain facts about that card, and I, I bring them up in both the, uh, the 1933 set that I, did, I covered and the 1934 set. Um, and as it turns out, uh, card 106 was uh, supposed to be... Um, Sorry about that, guys. There's a vacuum going on. Going on. Anyway, uh, so 106 is was meant to be um, uh, Leo Durocher, and somehow um, Napoleon Lajoie found his way on the card, and it's issued in the high number set. And oh, I can still hear that vacuum. <laughs> anyway, um, so the thing with uh, these auction houses is that. In order to gain um, more momentum for their cards in the auction, uh, they kind of some sometimes just embellished the truth or made up stories, so uh, they could get uh, people to to bid on the card. And that's a lot of times that's even the case with say the 1952 uh, tops of Mickey Mantle, and especially with the um, the 1909 T206 Hornus Wagner. Uh, the, these these stories are pretty great. They're pretty fantastic. But you have to ask yourself, what is reality and what is legend? You know, everybody has a reality. It's their own reality, um, and it varies slightly. And that's also found in books as well. So uh, Robin Hood, <laughs> especially, um, and King Arthur. So, uh, I mean, I know in King Arthur, um, there may have been somebody named King Arthur, um, but, you know, it, the reality is, f you know, a lot different from what is in the book, and the book is there to sell, right? Um, and, and, but they are, they are really fantastic, but um, a, a lot of times with uh, corporate media today, uh, it, they will leave out 
uh, key details in a story if uh, it doesn't suit an, a particular uh, narrative uh, that they want to sell. <laughs> um, and same with advertisers as well. So, uh, and that's where the conflict of interest comes in. So, in both of those, <laughs> in both of those cases, you have, um, you could have the, the, uh, the potential for a conflict of interest with an advertiser uh, if they're paying the um, media organization. Um, and so, people understand this and. Um, in newspaper circulation and um, media participation or people's participation in uh, regular uh, news broadcasts uh, is down to a, a, an all-time low that we haven't seen since 1940. And so the other aspect is uh, news uh, inter internet access. So uh, today it, it should be um, of greater importance to get the story correct uh, just because there's so many different outlets uh, that where if one newspaper refuses to report um, or a news outlet refuses to report the entire story, somebody's going to do it for them and it's going to look really bad on that newspaper uh, outlet or that media outlet that doesn't uh, do the story justice. Um, and so, uh, in, in my case, uh, I, I do what's uh, called long-form journalism, and this was actually, um, at one point, this was more common than it is now. And so, a lot of my stories are between 20 to 60 plus pages long, and I, I do that uh, for the simple reason is that when I was uh, when I was first starting out in the vintage hobby in, in the early 90s, uh, I got it in my mind that Jefferson Burdick looked more like Raymond Burr uh, because of <laughs> other dealers um, bantering back and forth about Jefferson Burdick. And I had nothing to go on. I had no photo or no nothing. Obviously, when I did find a photo, the guy looked nothing like uh, Raymond Burr. But um, that's, that's uh, why I, I kind of um, want to give my readers um, a, a much larger picture and more of a, a detailed uh, picture uh, of not only just the hobby, um, but of the players and the business owners and really anything that's surrounding uh, the cards to make them into reality. And... Um, uh, with that, guys, uh, until next time, I appreciate you stopping by and um, press a, a like or a subscribe, as they say. And, um, you know, the other thing, too, is that um, I really enjoy listening to other uh, commentators as well on sports cards. Uh, guys like Dustin, the personal finance dad, and Dakota from Sports Cards Anonymous and rolling with FD because they're not they're not always going to have the same stuff. Uh, they, they're going to have um, things that, that they found out and it may be um, a lot different than what I've thought of. And so I, I think the more content creators you have, uh, the better it is for the, the hobby in general. And this is what I'm getting at. Uh, is that you know with the media today it's it's in their best interest to um, to tell the truth and be honest and go after a story even if they don't like what they hear or if it goes against their ideology um, and the same is true with um, commentators uh, on YouTube and other platforms as well um, it can't hurt. Uh, it can only uh, do justice to the American people because they are the watchdogs for the American people. So, uh, like I said, until next time, guys, uh, have a good one. Thanks. Bye.